Section 28 of Diaries Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. 12th July 1654. We went to St John's, saw the library and the two skeletons, which are finely cleansed and put together. Observable here is also the store of mathematical instruments, chiefly given by the late Archbishop Lord, who built here a handsome quadrangle. Thence we went to New College, where the chapel was in its ancient garb, notwithstanding the scrupulosity of the times. Thence to Christ Church, in whose library was shown us an office of Henry the Eighth, the writing, miniatures and gilding whereof is equal, if not surpassing, any curiosity I had seen of that kind. It was given by their founder, Cardinal Wolsey. The glass windows of the cathedral, famous in my time, I found much abused. The ample hall and column that spreads its capital to sustain the roof as one goes up the stairs is very remarkable. Next we walked to Magdalen College, where we saw the library and chapel, which was likewise in pontifical order, the altar only, I think, turned table-wise, and there was still the double organ, which abominations, as now esteemed, were almost universally demolished, Mr. Gibbon, that famous musician, giving us a taste of his skill and talents on that instrument. Hence to the physic garden, where the sensitive plant was shown us for a great wonder. There grew canes, olive trees, rhubarb, but no extraordinary curiosities besides very good fruit, which, when the ladies had tasted, we returned in our coach to our lodgings. 13th July, 1654. We all dined at that most obliging and universally curious Dr. Wilkins at Wadham College. He was the first who showed me the transparent apiaries, which he had built like castles and palaces, and so ordered them one upon another as to take the honey without destroying the bees. These were adorned with a variety of dials, little statues, veins, etc., and he was so abundantly civil, finding me pleased with them, to present me with one of the hives which he had empty, and which I afterward had in my garden at Say's Court, where it continued many years, and which His Majesty came on purpose to see and contemplate with much satisfaction. He had also contrived a hollow statue which gave a voice and uttered words by a long concealed pipe that went to its mouth, while one speaks through it at a good distance. He had above in his lodgings and gallery variety of shadows, dials, perspectives, and many other artificial, mathematical and magical curiosities, a way-wiser, a thermometer, a monstrous magnet, conic and other sections, a balance on a demicircle, most of them of his own, and that prodigious young scholar, Mr. Christopher Wren, who presented me with a piece of white marble, which he had stained with a lively red, very deep, as beautiful as if it had been natural. Thus satisfied with the civilities of Oxford, we left it, dining at Farringdon, a town which had been newly fired during the wars, and passing near the seat of Sir Walter Pye, we came to Caddenham. 16th July, 1654. We went to another uncle and relative of my wife's, Sir John Glanville, a famous lawyer, formerly Speaker of the House of Commons. His seat is at Broad Hinton, where he now lived, but in the gatehouse, his very fair dwelling-house, having been burnt by his own hands to prevent the rebels making a garrison of it. Here my cousin William Glanville's eldest son showed me such a lock for a door that for its filing and rare contrivances was a masterpiece, yet made by a country blacksmith. But we have seen watches made by another with as much curiosity as the best of that profession can brag of, and not many years after there was nothing more frequent than all sorts of ironwork, more exquisitely wrought and polished than in any part of Europe, so as a door-lock of a tolerable price was esteemed a curiosity even among foreign princes. Went back to Caddam, and on the 19th to Sir Edward Bainton's at Spy Park, a place capable of being made a noble seat. 
but the humorous old knight has built a long single house of two low stories on the precipice of an incomparable prospect and landing on a bowling green in the park. The house is like a long barn and has not a window on the prospect side. After dinner they went to bowls and in the meantime our coachmen were made so exceedingly drunk that in returning home we escaped great dangers. This, it seems, was by order of the knight, that all gentlemen's servants be so treated, but the custom is barbarous, and much unbecoming a knight, still less a Christian. Salisbury, 20th July 1654. We proceeded to Salisbury. The cathedral I take to be the most complete piece of Gothic work in Europe, taking in all its uniformity. The pillars, reputed to be cast, are of stone, manifestly cut out of the quarry. Most observable are those in the chapter house. There are some remarkable monuments, particularly the ancient bishops, founders of the church, knights templars, the marquis of Hertfords, the cloisters of the palace and garden, and the great mural dial. In the afternoon we went to Wilton, a fine house of the Earl of Pembroke, in which the most observable are the dining room in the modern built park toward the garden, richly gilded and painted with story by decret, also some other apartments, as that of hunting landscapes by Pierce, some magnificent chimney pieces after the best French manner, a pair of artificial winding stairs of stone, and diverse rare pictures. The garden, heretofore esteemed the noblest in England, is a large, handsome plain with a grotto and waterworks, which might be made much more pleasant were the river that passes through cleansed and raised, for all is affected by mere force. It has a flower garden, not inelegant, but, after all, that which renders the seat delightful is, its being so near the downs and noble plains, about the country contiguous to it. The stables are well ordered, and yield a graceful front, by reason of the walks of lime-trees, with the court and fountain of the stables adorned with the Caesar's heads. We returned this evening by the plain, and fourteen-mile race, where out of my lord's hare warren we were entertained, with a long course of a hare for near two miles in sight. Near this is a pergola, or stand, built to view the sports, and so we came to Salisbury and saw the most considerable parts of the city. The market-place, with most of the streets, are watered by a quick current and pure stream running through the middle of them, but are negligently kept when, with a small charge, they might be purged and rendered infinitely agreeable, and this made one of the sweetest towns, but now the common buildings are despicable and the streets dirty. 22nd July 1654 We departed and dined at a farm of my uncle Hungerford's, called Darnford Magna, situated in a valley under the plain, most sweetly watered, abounding in trouts caught by spear in the night when they come attracted by a light set in the stern of a boat. After dinner, continuing our return, we passed over the goodly plain, or rather sea of carpet, which I think for evenness, extent, verdure and innumerable flocks, to be one of the most delightful prospects in nature, and reminded me of the pleasant lives of shepherds we read of in romances. Now we arrived at Stonehenge, indeed a stupendous monument, appearing at a distance like a castle, how so many and huge pillars of stone should have been brought together, some erect, others transverse on the tops of them, in a circular area as rudely representing a cloister or heathen and more natural temple, is wonderful. The stone is so exceedingly hard that all my strength with a hammer could not break a fragment, which hardness I impute to their so long exposure. To number them exactly is very difficult, they lie in such variety of postures and confusion, though they seem not to exceed a hundred. We counted only ninety-five. As to their being brought thither, there being no navigable river near, is by some admired. But for the stone there seems to be the same kind, about twenty miles distant, some of which appear above ground. About the same hills are diverse mounts, raised, 
conceived to be ancient entrenchments or places of burial after bloody fights. We now went by Devizes, a reasonable large town, and came late to Cadenham. 27th July 1654, to the hunting of a sorrel deer, and had excellent chase for four or five hours, but the venison little worth. 29th July 1654, I went to Langford to see my cousin Stevens. I also saw Dryfield, the house heretofore of Sir John Pretiman, grandfather to my wife, and sold by her uncle. Both a seat and house, very honourable and well built, much after the modern fashion. 31st July 1654. Taking leave of Cadnam, where we had been long and nobly entertained, we went to Compass into Leicestershire, where dwelt another relation of my wife's, for I indeed made these excursions to show her the most considerable parts of her native country, who from her childhood had lived altogether in France, as well as from my own curiosity and information. Gloucester About two miles before coming to Gloucester, we have a prospect from woody hills into a most goodly vale and country. Gloucester is a handsome city, considerable for the church and monuments. The minster is indeed a noble fabric. The whispering gallery is rare, being through a passage of twenty-five yards in a many-angled cloister, and was, I suppose, either to show the skill of the architect or some invention of a cunning priest, who, standing unseen in a recess in the middle of the chapel, might hear whatever was spoken at either end. This is above the choir, in which lies buried King Stephen, under a monument of Irish oak, not ill-carved, considering the age. The new library is a noble, though a private design. I was likewise pleased with the seven gliding so sweetly by it. The Duke's house, the castle works, are now almost quite dismantled, nor yet without sad thoughts did I see the town, considering how fatal the siege had been a few years before to our good king. 1st August 1654 we set out toward Worcester by a way thickly planted with cider fruit. We deviated to the holy wells, trickling out of a valley through a steep declivity toward the foot of the great Malvern hills. They are said to heal many infirmities, as king's evil, leprosy, sore eyes, etc. Ascending a great height above them to the trench divided England from South Wales, we had the prospect of all Herefordshire, Radnor, Brecknock, Monmouth, Worcester, Gloucester, Shropshire, Warwick, Derbyshire's, and many more. We could discern Tewkesbury, King's Road, toward Bristol, etc. So as I esteem it one of the goodliest vistas in England. 2nd August 1654 this evening we arrived at Worcester, the judges of assize and sheriff just entering as we did. Viewing the town the next day, we found the cathedral much ruined by the late wars, otherwise a noble structure. The town is neatly paved and very clean, the goodly river Severn running by it and standing in a most fertile country. 3rd August 1654 We pass next through Warwick, and saw the castle, the dwelling-house of the Lord Brook, and the furniture noble. It is built on an eminent rock which gives prospect into a most goodly green, a woody and plentifully watered country, the river running so delightfully under it that it may pass for one of the most surprising seats one should meet with. The gardens are prettily disposed, but might be much improved. Here they showed us Sir Guy's great two-handed sword, staff, horse arms, pot, and other relics of that famous knight errant. Warwick is a fair old town, and hath one church full of ancient monuments. Having viewed these, I went to visit my worthy friend Sir H. Puckering at the Abbey, and though a melancholy old seat, yet in a rich soil. Hence to Sir Guy's grot, where they say he did his penances and died. It is a squalid den made in the rock, crowned yet with venerable oaks, and looking on a goodly stream, so as, were it improved as it might be, it were capable of being made a most romantic and pleasant place. 
Near this we were showed his chapel and gigantic statue, hewn out of the solid rock, out of which there are likewise diverse other caves cut, and some very capacious. The next place to Coventry. The cross is remarkable for Gothic work and rich gilding, comparable to any I had ever seen, except that of Cheapside in London, now demolished. This city has many handsome churches, a beautiful wall, a fair free school and library to it, the streets full of great shops, clean and well paved. At going forth the gate, they show us the bone or rib of a wild boar, said to have been killed by Sir Guy, but which I take to be the chin of a whale. Leicester 4th August 1654 Hence, riding through a considerable part of Leicestershire, an open, rich, but unpleasant country, we came late in the evening to Horninghold, a seat of my wife's uncle. 7th August 1654. Went to Uppingham, the shire town of Rutland, pretty and well built of stone, which is a rarity in that part of England, where most of the rural parishes are but of mud and the people living as wretchedly as in the most impoverished parts of France, which they much resemble, being idle and sluttish. The country, especially Leicestershire, much in common, the gentry free drinkers. 9th August 1654. To the old and ragged city of Leicester, large and pleasantly seated, but despicably built, the chimney flues like so many smith's forges, however famous for the tomb of the tyrant Richard III, which is now converted to a cistern, at which I think cattle drink. Also here, in one of the churches, lies buried the magnificent Cardinal Wolsey. John of Gaunt has here also built a large but poor hospital, near which a wretch has made him a house out of the ruins of a stately church. Saw the ruins of an old Roman temple, thought to be of Janus entertained at a very fine collection of fruits, such as I did not expect to meet with so far north, especially very good melons. We return to my uncle's. 14th August 1654. I took a journey into the northern parts, riding through Oakham, a pretty town in Rutlandshire, famous for the tenure of the barons, Ferrers, who hold it by taking off a shoe from every nobleman's horse that passes with his lord through the street, unless redeemed with a certain piece of money. In token of this are several gilded shoes, nailed up on the castle gate, which seems to have been large and fair. Hence we went by Brook, a very sweet seat and park of the old Lady Camden's, next by Burley House, belonging to the Duke of Buckingham, and worthily reckoned amongst the noblest seats in England, situate on the brow of a hill built à la Mordaine, near a park walled in, and a fine wood at the descent. Now we were come to Cotsmoor, a pretty seat belonging to Mr Heath, son of the late Lord Chief Justice of that name. Here after dinner, parting with the company that conducted us thus far, I passed that evening by Beaver Castle, built on a round mount at the point of a long ridge of hills, which affords a stately prospect and is famous for its strenuous resistance in the late civil war. Went by Newark-on-Trent, a brave town and garrison, next by Wharton House, belonging to the Lord Charworth, a handsome seat, then by Home, a noble place belonging to the Marquis of Dorchester, and past the famous River Trent, which divides the south from the north of England, and so lay that night at Nottingham. This whole town and county seems to be but one entire rock, as it were, an exceedingly pleasant shire, full of gentry. Here I observed diverse to live in the rocks and caves, much after the manner as about Tours in France. The church is well built on an eminence. There is a fair house of the Lord Clare's, another of Pierpont's, an ample market-place, large streets, full of crosses, the relics of an ancient castle, hollowed beneath which are many caverns, especially that of the Scots king, and his work while there. This place is remarkable for being the place where His Majesty first erected his standard at the beginning of our late unhappy differences. The prospects from this city towards the river and meadows are most delightful. 
15th August 1654. We pass next through Sherwood Forest, accounted the most extensive in England, then Papelwick, an incomparable vista with a pretty castle near it. Thence we saw Newstead Abbey, belonging to the Lord Byron, situated much like Fontainebleau in France, capable of being made a noble seat, accommodated as it is with brave woods and streams. It has yet remained the front of a glorious abbey church. Next by Mansfield Town, then Welbeck, the house of the Marquis of Newcastle, seated in a bottom in a park and environed with woods, a noble yet melancholy seat. The palace is a handsome and stately building. Next to Worksop Abbey, almost demolished, the church has a double flat tower entire and a pretty gate. The manor belongs to the Earl of Arundel and has to it a fair house at the foot of a hill in a park that affords a delicate prospect. Tickle, the town and castle, has a very noble prospect, all these in Nottinghamshire. 16th August 1654. We arrived at Doncaster, where we lay this night. It is a large, fair town, famous for great wax lights and good stockings. 17th August 1654. Passed through Pontefract, the castle famous for many sieges, both of late and ancient times, and the death of that unhappy king murdered in it, Richard II, was now demolishing by the rebels. It stands on a mount and makes a goodly show at a distance. The Queen has a house here, and there are many fair seats near it, especially Mr. Pierpont's, built at the foot of a hill out of the castle ruins. We all alighted in the highway to drink at a crystal spring, which they call Robin Hood's well. Near it is a stone chair and an iron ladle to drink out of, chained to the seat. We rode to Tadcaster, at the side of which we have prospect of the Archbishop's Palace, which is a noble seat, and in sight of diverse other gentlemen's fair houses. This tract is a goodly, fertile, well-watered and wooded country, abounding with pasture and plenty of provisions. York. To York, the second city of England, fairly walled, of a circular form, watered by the brave river Ouse, bearing vessels of considerable burden on it. Over it is a stone bridge, emulating that of London, and built on. The middle arch is larger than any I have seen in England, with a wharf of hewn stone, which makes the river appear very neat. But most remarkable and worth seeing is St Peter's Cathedral, which of all the great churches in England, had been best preserved from the fury of the sacrilegious by composition with the rebels when they took the city during the many excursions of Scotch and others. It is a most entire magnificent piece of Gothic architecture. The screen before the choir is of stone carved with flowers, running work and statues of the old kings. Many of the monuments are very ancient. Here is a great rarity in these days and at this time. They showed me a Bible and common prayer book, covered with crimson velvet and richly embossed with silver gilt. Also a service for the altar of gilt wrought plate. Flagons, basin, ewer, plates, chalices, patins, etc. With the gorgeous covering for the altar and pulpit, carefully preserved in the vestry, in the hollow wall whereof rises a plentiful spring of excellent water. I got up to the tower, whence we had a prospect toward Durham, and could see Ripon, part of Lancashire, the famous and fatal Marston Moor, the spars of Knaresborough, and all the environs of that admirable country. Sir Inglesby has here a large house, gardens and tennis court also the king's house and church near the castle, which was modernly fortified with a palisade and bastions. The streets are narrow and ill-paved, the shops like London. 18th August 1654. We went to Beverley, a large town with two stately churches, St John's and St Mary's, not much inferior to the best of our cathedrals. Here a very old woman showed us the monuments, and being above a hundred years of age, spoke the language of Queen Mary's days, in whose time she was born. 
she was widow of a sexton who had belonged to the church a hundred years. Hentry passed through a fenny but rich country to Hull, situated like Calais, modernly and strongly fortified, with three block houses of brick and earth. It has a good market-place and harbour for ships. Famous also, or rather infamous, is this town for Hotham's refusing entrance to His Majesty. The waterhouse is worth seeing, and here ends the south of Yorkshire. 19th August 1654. We passed the Humber, an arm of the sea of about two leagues breadth. The weather was bad, but we crossed it in a good barge to Barton, the first town in that part of Lincolnshire. All marsh ground till we came to Brig, famous for the plantations of licorice, and then had brave pleasant riding to Lincoln. Lincoln much resembling Salisbury Plain. Lincoln is an old confused town very long, uneven, steep and ragged, formerly full of good houses, especially churches and abbeys. The minster almost comparable to that of York itself, abounding with marble pillars and having a fair front. Herein was interred Queen Eleanor, the loyal and loving wife who sucked the poison out of her husband's wound. The abbot found her with rare carving in the stone, the great bell or tom as they call it. I went up the steeple, from whence is a goodly prospect all over the country. The soldiers had lately knocked off most of the brasses from the gravestones, so as few inscriptions were left. They told us that these men went in with axes and hammers and shut themselves in till they had rent and torn off some barge loads of metal, not sparing even the monuments of the dead, so hellish an avarice possessed them, beside which they exceedingly ruined the city. Here I saw a tall woman, six feet two inches high, comely, middle-aged and well-proportioned, who kept a very neat and clean alehouse, and got most by people's coming to see her on account of her height. 20th August 1654. From hence we had a most pleasant ride over a large heath open, like Salisbury Plain, to Grantham, a pretty town so well situated on the side of a bottom which is large and at a distance environed with ascending grounds, that for pleasure I consider it incomparable to most inland places of England. Famous is the steeple for the exceeding height of the shaft, which is of stone. About eighteen miles south we pass by a noble seat and see Boston at a distance. Here we came to a parish of which the parson had tithe ale. Thence through Rutland we brought night to Horninghold, from whence I set out on this excursion. 22nd August 1654 I went to Setting and Hawking, where we had tolerable sport. 25th August 1654 To see Kirby, a very noble house of my Lord Hatton's in Northamptonshire, built à la moderne. The garden and stables agreeable, but the avenue ungraceful, and the seat naked, returned that evening. 27th August 1654 Mr. Allington preached an excellent discourse from Romans 6.19. This was he who published those bold sermons of the members' warning against the mind or the Jews crucifying Christ, applied to the wicked regicides, for which he was ruined. We had no sermon in the afternoon. 30th August 1654. Taking leave of my friends, who had now feasted me more than a month, I, with my wife, etc., set our faces toward home, and got this evening to Peterborough, passing by a stately palace, Thorpe, of St. John's, one deep in the blood of our good king, built out of the ruins of the bishop's palace and cloister. The church is exceeding fair, full of monuments of great antiquity. Here lies Queen Catherine, the unhappy wife of Henry VIII, and the no less unfortunate Mary, Queen of Scots. On the steeple we viewed the fens of Lincolnshire, now much enclosed and drained with infinite expense, and by many sluices, cuts, mounds and ingenious mills, and the like inventions, at which the city and country about it, consisting of a poor and very lazy sort of people, were much displeased. 
Peterborough is a handsome town and hath another well-built church. 31st August 1654 Through part of Huntingdonshire we passed that town, fair and ancient, a river running by it. The country about it so abounds in wheat that when any king of England passes through it they have a custom to meet him with a hundred ploughs. Cambridge This evening to Cambridge and went first to St John's College, well built of brick and library, which I think is the fairest of that university. One Mr Benlow's has given it all the ornaments of Pietra Comessa, whereof a table and one piece of perspective is very fine. Other trifles there also be of no great value, besides a vast old songbook or service and some fair manuscripts. There hangs in the library the picture of John Williams, Archbishop of York, sometime Lord Keeper, my kinsman, and their great benefactor. Trinity College is said by some to be the fairest quadrangle of any university in Europe, but in truth is far inferior to that of Christ Church in Oxford. The hall is ample and of stone, the fountain in the quadrangle is graceful, the chapel and library fair. There they showed us the prophetic manuscript of the famous Grebner, but the passage and emblem which they would apply to our late king is manifestly relating to the Swedish. In truth it seems to be a mere fantastic rhapsody, however the title may bespeak strange revelations. There is an office in manuscript with fine miniatures and some other antiquities given by the Countess of Richmond, mother of Henry VIII, and the before-mentioned Archbishop Williams, when Bishop of Lincoln. The library is pretty well stored. The Greek professor had me into another large quadrangle, cloistered and well built, and gave us a handsome collation in his own chamber. Thence to Keyes, and afterward to King's College, where I found the chapel altogether answered expectation, especially the roof all of stone, which for the flatness of its laying and carving may I conceive vie with any in Christendom. The condignation of the roof which I went upon, weight and artificial joining of the stones, is admirable. The lights are also very fair. In one aisle lies the famous Dr. Collins, so celebrated for his fluency in the Latin tongue. From this roof we could descry Ely and the encampment of Sturbridge Fair now beginning to set up their tents and booths, also Royston, Newmarket, etc., houses belonging to the King. The library is too narrow. Clare Hall is of a new and noble design, but not finished. Peterhouse, formerly under the government of my worthy friend Dr. Joseph Cosin, Dean of Peterborough, a pretty neat college, having a delicate chapel, next to Sydney, a fine college. Catherine Hall, though a mean structure, is yet famous for the learned Bishop Andrews, once master. Emmanuel College, that zealous house, where to the hall they have a parlour for the fellows. The chapel is reformed, aborigine, built north and south, and meanly erected, as is the library. Jesus College, one of the best built, but in a melancholy situation. Next to Christ College, a very noble erection, especially the modern part, built without the quadrangle toward the gardens, of exact architecture. The schools are very despicable, and public library, but mean, though somewhat improved by the wainscoting and books lately added by the Bishop Bancroft's library and manuscripts. They showed us little of antiquity, only King James's works being his own gift and kept very reverently. The marketplace is very ample and remarkable for old Hobson, the pleasant carrier's beneficence of a fountain. But the whole town is situate in a low, dirty, unpleasant place, the streets ill-paved, the air thick and infected by the fens, nor are its churches, of which St Mary's is the best, anything considerable in compare to Oxford. From Cambridge we went to Audley End and spent some time in seeing that goodly base built by Howard, Earl of Suffolk, once Lord Treasurer. It is a mixed fabric between antique and modern, but observable for its being completely finished and without comparison is one of the stateliest palaces in the kingdom. It consists of two courts, the first very large, winged with cloisters. The front had a double entrance, 
the hall is fair but somewhat too small for so august a pile the kitchen is very large as are the cellars arched with stone very neat and well disposed these offices are joined by a wing out of the way very handsomely the gallery is the most cheerful and i think one of the best in england a fair dining room and the rest of the lodgings answerable with a pretty chapel the gardens are not in order though well enclosed it has also a bowling alley a noble well walled wooded and watered park full of fine colline and ponds the river glides before the palace to which is an avenue of lime trees but all this is much diminished by its being placed in an obscure bottom for the rest is a perfectly uniform structure and shows without like a diadem by the decorations of the cupolas and other ornaments on the pavilions instead of rails and balusters there is a border of capital letters as was lately also on suffolk house near charing cross built by the same lord treasurer this house stands in the parish of saffron walden famous for the abundance of saffron there cultivated and esteemed the best of any foreign country. End of section 28